How we got it all going, it's still beside me. Like, it's, it's a crazy story. Dean at the time was trying to learn how to code, and that was, we were failing, well, uh, we yeah, were well, failing miserably at that. Well, but, I want to ask you about that. Yeah, so I, to, what I took from that was you guys, you were distributors, really, really in the true sense of the word at the beginning. How, how, what were the roles back then? I know you tend to do everything together when you're doing a startup, but you, what, what are the, seeing as we're getting to know you guys, what, what is your strength? What do you still work on in, in terms of get, needing to get better at and vice versa? What makes you guys good partners? Because no one gets to where you've gotten without being complimentary. So what, what makes you tick? Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny because Dean and I, we have two different brains. Uh, I think if there was two of me or well, two... an accountant and a dentist, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Very but uh, we've always agreed uh, like at the, a fundamental level. And so um, I would say I was more on the business side, went to business school, got an accounting designation. Uh, Dean always really understood social and, and tech and kind of was always on the newest trends, so really got content. And then it was our third amigo, we call him. So there's another founder that isn't, isn't here today. But it wasn't until we actually met him in the summer of 13 um, where like we had this great idea, but we weren't able to actually execute on the technical side. And so the three of us kind of coming together was really that, 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 that bond that allowed us to, to, to get going and, and think about cash. So when we launched in November 13, like we were cash flow positive after 30 days. So that's thinking about how to make money um, at the same time as trying to build a great product, I think makes us very Canadian, but uh, I think it's, it's, it's super important. Got because, it. You know, a lot of tech companies go out there and they try to raise, you know, $5 million in seed money and they've got no path to revenue and they end up burning out, right? So I, I think, you know, the three of us with three different minds, it, it allowed us to um, really get this thing going. So I'll pause for a lesson there on uh, early stage companies. I've been in the tech space, I guess, 30 plus years and I've never done anything on my own, right? I've always had a partner or more, one or more, to augment what the, the list, the long list of things I'm not particularly skilled at. So, no, uh, I meet very few companies that are, uh, you know, singularly driven by one set of skills and one person doing it all. So, you know, another another great example of that. Okay, so you you're, you're distributing this content, and you you went through Facebook. Things are going well. Then where did the business go? How did you evolve it uh, from there? What were the next uh, steps? Yeah, so launching in November of 13, um, we were a very small team, but we were, you know, we were delivering to audience content and now a, a tool that actually could help you make money, right? So it wasn't just us. We were, we were finding you know, other influencers out there that would need our, our content team. And, and so really a snowball effect happened. Um, so, so I'd say in 14, I think we got up to about 15 people. But I still remember the founding group getting together and even though we didn't have a lot of money and we were bootstrapped, uh, we could see in the market that the traditional guys weren't understanding how to get to a user, like how to find them, right? Like goes back, I used to run a window cleaning company back in university and I'd go out and knock on doors, 200 doors a night and I made sure I would go and if I could knock on 400 doors, I knew I'd get enough sales for the week, right? And so it's that concept of let's, let's let's not just build content and try to get people to come to us or build a platform and get them to come to us. Let's go find that, that user. And how, how you engage with them, how you relate with them is really core to our, our whole business model, right? And so we could see that the traditional guys weren't under, understanding how to do that. Um, and so even though we didn't have a lot of money, we could punch well above our, our weight category. And so that year we said, you know what, let's do it, let's go for it. Like, cause at that time we probably could have kept it really lean and probably made a lot of money on the, on like from a profit perspective, but we're like, I think we can make something much bigger than who we are today. And so that year is when we started to build out, you know, the back office, I call it. So as entrepreneurs, we're like, fuck it, let's do it kind of thing on the, sorry, screw it, let's do it kind of thing on the um, external wheel, right? And you, you, you always want to take on more, and, 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 but as entrepreneurs sometimes we forget about the back wheel, which really supports your business for scale. And so early on we're like, we got to get the right people in. We brought a CFO, we brought a COO, we brought in someone from an HR perspective. All people that you know, were many years older than us, and so, sorry if you guys are in the, in the crowd, Gord and Melissa, but... You're sitting uh, beside one, so Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but they had been there and done it, and so they really helped us get 
you know, the, the business straight and so that we could scale. And that year we went from 15 to 115 people. So when you're hiring a net 100 people in a year, um, that's, a, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of talent. Um, we're very lucky and, and humbled to have, you know, Western and Fanshawe in London help grow our, our business pretty quickly. So what, what, what's a typical Dipley employee uh, look like? What are their brand characteristics? What's the culture of the place? Get the yeah, there are a bunch of odd ducks, actually, so, um, and there's a bunch of them here, so, and I, I think that's important when, when we're hiring, like, we, you can find really smart talent, you can find people that could do the job, but, like, at the end of the day, before we hire them, we always ask, like, are they Dipley? Do they have the Dipley, you know, culture feel of who they are, right? And so maintaining that as you scale is a very difficult thing. And it's not easy, and, and we're not perfect, and Dipley by far isn't perfect, but you, you gotta continue to invest in the people, because uh, it's truly them that are all the success. So throw have. some words at us. What, 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 is the, what is a Dipley person? What, is, what makes for a Dipley well, we have our team member? Core values, obviously. Um, you know, a lot of our employees seriously have the heart, so giving back is something that's near and dear to our chest. Um, but the grit is something that I think is, is the most valuable thing that the Dipley employees have. I mean, we've been caught into some serious trouble sometimes, and just the grit of the employees being in and around us, like Taylor said, it's all about the people. And, um, you know, we often take credit for a lot of the things that um, happen, but it's truly the team in and around us that have actually built this business with us. It's not just us. Sure, we may be, you know, nominated for a lot of these awards, but it's it's truly the team in and around us that have helped us get to where we at. Um, impact as well. So, um, you know, the level of impact that these guys have, working day in day out, um, pouring their heart and energy into this into into making Dipley what it is today has been. Uh, something and you know what like at the end of the day um, Our employees are you know the absolute best. We love them so much. Thank you guys for coming out and and supporting us here today um, Even the ones that have been with us since day one It's been uh, an incredible journey, and I think we owe a lot of a lot of our success to our overall employees Yeah, sounds like they all love what they do so you know sort of small business lesson number two that I'm hearing here I've seen personally seen very few companies scale past $10 million in sales, $20 million in sales, without giving some thought to uh, the type of person you want to build from. Because what happens is when you get north of 80 employees, you guys aren't in on every hire, right? So the people that you hire, what playbook are they going from to make sure that Dipley you know, maintains that gritty, do what it takes to get it done culture. So gl glad to hear you guys have got that done. Um, where you know, before I go to sort of the future, uh, you guys have yeah, started out pretty broad, I would, I would imagine, in terms of the content and sort of trial by era, error, who's viewing what. You've, you've ended up gravitating heavily to the millennial market. Tell us about, you know, what led to that decision. Um, what do people need to know about this market that makes it the one to be hitting? Yeah, absolutely. And millennials are very interesting, uh, I need to say. Um, they all have extremely short attention spans. Um, the average user scrolls through 300 feet of newsfeed on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so you really have a very small window and small opportunity to be able to captivate the attention of um, the fan, we like to call them. So uh, from that perspective, um, there's, there's a lot of different areas. For example, mobile is a huge one, um, predominantly being on Facebook alone. Um, very, very mobile driven. Over 85% of uh, millennials own a smartphone, and they check that on average about 43 times a day, which is enormous, right? So tremendous amount of opportunity to be able to uh, connect with that millennial on a platform like Facebook. Do you happen to know within that 43 times a day, how many of those times are checking Facebook? Yeah, so Facebook, 90% of millennials are on Facebook and they actually are on, on platform for over two hours a day. So, you know, checking your phone 43 times and being on Facebook two hours a day is enormous opportunity to be able to tap in 
um, to a platform like Facebook. So, um, you know, there's a lot of small companies out there and they're trying to do one too many things, trying to go after Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Google+, Musical.ly, whatever it may be, the new platform that comes out. And I think if you're very resource constrained, the main focus should be on Facebook today. That's where all the millennials are living, breathing, sleeping. That's where they wake up, you know, the first thing they do is grab their phone. That's where they're, you know, getting all their news from. They're not waiting for the six o'clock news to figure out what's happening around the world. They're almost getting it instantaneously. Um, through the newsfeed. So there's, uh, you know, I'm hearing more and more talk about Generation Z. Right. And I was with one of them on the weekend, got some time with my daughter, and we were, you know, on some of the Dipley content, crafty, as a matter of fact, some really cool stuff there. Um, she's not on Facebook, okay? Thank, thank the Lord, she's not on <laughs> Facebook. So this next generation, Generation Z, 12 to 19, I think the definition is, where is that headed in terms, is that going to be, I mean, the attention spans are getting shorter probably again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so for, for Gen Z, it's something that we're obviously, um, it's obviously on our radar. We're not actively targeting Gen Z users today. I think we're trying to really conquer that millennial segment first. But it is one that we're very alive to and one that we want to actually um, conquer hopefully one day. But, um, you know, the attention spans, like you said, are getting shorter. Um, a lot of them are using other platforms like Snapchat, Musical.ly, etc. Um, they're very used to short form, form content, but 85% um, of um, Gen Zers actually look at things like social influencers with the same light as they look at celebrities. Um, a lot of their consumption, you know, from an advertisement perspective as well, there's not many, you know, they're not a spending generation, right? They're still very young. They don't have a spending power. So from an advertisement perspective... Bruce may disagree with that. <laughs> but my, you know, he's right. I'm hoping it stays that way. But I can, yeah. I'm seeing some warning signs on yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. So as the, you know, that group starts to expand, we're kind of like a wait and see type thing with that specific generation. Um, but essentially, Gen Zers are like millennials on steroids. So they were born on digital. They're going to be spending way more time than millennials on digital. Um, their consumption behaviors. Um, there was uh, Defy Media actually did a survey that asked um, uh, Gen Zers, what's the platform that you can't live without? Um, and they said YouTube. So it's very interesting to see. So after YouTube came Instagram and then Facebook. So it's obviously not a Facebook thing now. As they start to mature and get older, are they going to start to adapt the likes of the, the, the Instagrams and the Facebook of the world? Or are they primarily going to be watching 30, 40 minute blogs on their favorite social influencer? Good question. Um, before we show a couple of examples of your content, um, you know, there is a lot of discussion. I mean, mobile, 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 mobile. mobile. You know, I, I tend to I'm getting, I'm almost getting past that and think, I'm just saying it's mobile by default, you know, and, and the hardware comes in different sizes, all stored in the cloud, et cetera. I, I'm much more interested in the discussion about um, the browser versus the app and what you guys think about that in terms of a user experience and, and whether you have plans for a Diply app or wh where, where are we at in that evolution? Yeah, it's a good point. I, like, I agree um, on, in regards to screens, a screen. So if it's your TV, it's a smart TV. If it's a phone, if it's your desktop. We, I think the online world is all thinking of that the same. And the online has brought that connectivity and, and allows you to put content on any format. So we agree with you. I, I think the stat we had was 30% of our users three years ago were on desktop. It's about 6% now. So um, the only people that are actually really looking through desktop are the ones that work. And, uh, and also, so there's still 6% of people playing a lot of hooky, but, um, but it's also the brands, right? So when you walk into a, an agency or a brand, the first thing they do when they're looking you up is, oh, Dipley, let me check, right? And so um, I still think there's an importance on, from a brand perspective, to build out the right homepage. Um, but we're really starting to think about an app. Um, we were mobile first. Um, site, so we were always very reactive with our content. So when you come into our browsing experience, it, it, it acts like an app. Why we haven't built an app yet is, is, is it's a strategic question. It's, we didn't think it would make sense at, to just replicate what we're doing on the mobile experience. Yeah, what does it add? 
right? Is the yeah, course. exactly. So you have to add something. You have to get your, your, your fans involved with the app in some way. So how do you get them contributing to the platform? How do you, how do you engage with them? And so we've got a lot of ideas um, on that, and we're excited to start rolling those out in 2018. So we will have an iOS and an Android app by, by end of year. Um, but really focusing on um, the web side was, was, was key for us to get the scale we did in a, such a short amount of time. So. Got it. Yeah, what I've noticed by hanging around with you guys a little bit, we did a BNN Disruptors interview with, with you last week, is I'm starting to realize you're as much a data company as you are a content producer. I mean, you, you seem to have a very deep understanding of the type, uh, of the demographic of people that are consuming your content. I mean, that must be driving a lot of your decision making in terms of choosing what to redistribute or what to create. Yeah, absolutely. So with respects to you know, the content creation component, um, everything we do is tested for engagement um, and click-throughs. Um, so if you look at the editorial process, we're constantly changing up things like thumbnail images, titles, doing A-B tests between the two, and really figuring out which one's going to you know, harvest the most uh, attraction or the most engagement and, and clicks at the end of the day. Um, the same thing goes for when we're producing any kind of video content. Um, we're also manipulating things like, you know, the intro. Sometimes you can, you know, post a video and then within, you know, a few minutes you'll just know that, you know, 75% of the users are dropping off after the first three seconds. And talking about, you know, fighting for the attention of the users, obviously through when people are scrolling through the feed, you need to be able to hook them almost instantaneously um, to keep them attentive attentive and to actually have them watch the full, the full video. Um, so data is a very big uh, piece of what we do. We obviously have a, a million different data points, but it's really how, do we, how are we able to use that data. But data alone doesn't give you all the answers. And that's where you know, the art component comes in. We like to think of it as you know, an art and a science of content creation. Um, now with respect to the art component, that's really the creative side of things. But um, to give you an example, if we're looking at a piece of content, let's just say it's an article, and we find that the data is telling us it has an extremely high bounce rate, um, that doesn't always paint the full picture, right? Um, it might not tell you that you know, the third image is actually outdated and people have seen it millions of times and now you know, you've got them to drop off because you're showing old content. Um, it might not tell you that you know, the, the joke that you thought your you know, millennial audience was gonna love was in fact you know, just not funny at all. Right? So these, that's where it requires a little bit of the human touch and the human component and uh, the creatives to be able to kind of uh, hone in and make sense of what that data actually looks like. So pulling it all together, for people that are uh, not at your level in terms of billions of views and, and 180 staff to help you out, if you had to give you know, one piece of advice, I'll, I'll ask each of you in turn, to, to people that are at an earlier stage, Right, that are trying to build either a social following for themselves or the brands that they work for, where would you start on the, on the advice? Um, one of the things that we've kind of done from the very beginning and I think is, you know, we attribute a lot of our success um, that came out of it is, is collaboration. Um, so our collaboration with others, whether it be um, you know, other companies, other businesses in the same segment, whether it be influencers, um, whether it be other writers, um, that's something that we kind of keep near and dear to our chest, so always trying to collaborate with other individuals. Um, at the time, you know, we've worked with people from all over the globe, we've traveled to over 40 different countries to actually meet the people that we work with. Um, but even, like, if I'm a content creator and I'm just starting up, trying to look for other content creators to get help, um, try and seed your content in other areas, so maybe reaching out to other larger pages to have them either share your, 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 your images or your links or your videos or whatever it may be that you want to really get out there. Um, and that, that, that honestly can be very successful for a new uh, content creator, right? So um, just taking the ability of, of, of collaboration and, and what you're doing and getting help from others um, is something that I would definitely recommend to other, other individuals. Anything to add to that? Just go for it, you know. Um, finding your passion and, and being relentless in your pursuit of that has been something that's changed me as a person. I, I, I was a, an accountant, like I said, for four years, and like I'd never take that back. It allowed, 
it like allowed me to build my toolkit. And so throughout my whole career, I always talk about this toolkit, and you got to keep adding to it. And and like whatever your final destination is, you, you got to be adding to that toolkit as you go. And it's so much more rewarding to do that when you love what you do. And when you wake up every morning and you really want to get to work and you want to kill it. And I, like, I look at life as zero, I'm a hand talker, but to 80, right? And you're born and then you die. So that's your, that's your timeline, right? And when you think about when you start working, you start at 16 and you're 65, right? So when, when's, the, when's the peak of your life? Like when, when are you, you, you gotta be loving what you do every day throughout that whole time, right? So just find your passion is, is probably my biggest point. It sounds like the Dipley there. culture that you were describing earlier. So listen, one, one last uh, point of discussion, and before we, are we, Elle, are we doing a, a q and A? Is there time for q and A? Okay. Um, so I grew up in an era of television, and you know, I, I grew up hearing over and over again from people that were producing content, you know, content is king. Right? If you have a good piece of content, it can last forever. And there has been some iconic content created and, and that'll stay with me for my entire life. So I'll, when I was at an impressionable, impressionable age, I'll, it'll always be with me. In this, in this age of like hyper short attention spans, um, where it's sort of show me something new, show me something new, show me something new, is content still king or is it, is it data and distribution and knowing your audience to feed them what they want every second, is that the key to success now in the content generating business? Yeah, I, I truly believe that content is still king. Um, we like to think that distribution is queen, right? And I think they both go hand in hand. Um, but you know, you can have an amazing seed of some sort, but without planting it, it will never flourish. Right? So content is kind of the same way. You can have an amazing piece of content that you've spent a million dollars trying to create, but if you don't plant that in the areas where it'll flourish, it'll never really get anywhere. And so that's where, why we think, you know, you know we, we'll always say content's king and distribution's queen, and um, without actually taking that piece of content, putting it somewhere where it allows it to flourish, it will never go. So for example, like, you know, you asked me a question earlier regarding like if, if I'm a new content creator, you know, how can I get my content out there? That, that sense of collaboration where I can go to someone else who might have the distribution to allow that seed to flourish will then, you know, allow me as a content creator to get the attention that I need. And then as my, you know, organic following starts to build and build and build, there's gonna come a crucial time where I won't need to look, you know, to others to distribute the content, I can just start doing it on my own. Fair enough. Listen, um, I just want to close by, by I, I guess, once again, paying tribute to you guys. Uh, the nearest competitor that I'm aware of in the space is a company called BuzzFeed, uh, and their sales are higher than yours at present, but from a business perspective, I happen to know that the amount of money and resources that have gone into that company to get them to where they are today versus how two guys from London, Ontario, an accountant and a dentist, uh, have been able to rally 180 people on the amount of capital that you guys have used to get to where you are today. It's like night and day. And I see a lot of companies, um, and I see very few that have been able to do what you've been able to do. So I congratulate you. You've earned your spot here. And if you get a chance to spend any time with either of these two guys, I suggest you take it because there's a lot of brain power in this uh, small but growing Canadian success story. So thanks very much for taking the time, guys. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Two questions. There's two questions out there. Fire away. There is no such thing as a dumb question. Oh, got one in the middle. Hi, um, I'm just curious to know what you guys did when you were in the beginning stages of your company to ensure that you were able to retain that core team to really build it, build the foundation. Yeah, so um, 
I think a lot of the people that we first, some of them are in the crowd. I think you guys started about 12.50 an hour with us. So um, it's gotta be much more than, than, than money, right? And I think as leaders, you have to paint that picture. I, I explain it to a lot of my staff and they're gonna roll their eyes a little bit. It's like, it's like climbing a, a mountain and you're climbing Everest. And if you can give them a picture of that mountain, uh, people will move mountains for you. They'll climb that, that journey with you. And you gotta continue to reward them and you gotta continue to celebrate the wins as you do it, right? And it's, it's, it's one of those where if, if they can believe in the, in, in the, in the vision that you're, you're creating and, and you feel like you're making impact in, in, the, in the markets that you're operating in, people buy in. So it, it's much more than, than just money. We've, like, we're very proud about our ESA program. So over 60% of our staff actually have stake in the business as well. So um, we're, big, we're big believers in, in, in making people think as though they're owners as well, because it really is, it's not just, it's not just us standing up here, it's, it's the whole collective. And to add to that, like, you know, you, you want to be able to help your employees grow and flourish over the years that they're with you. And if you set a, you know, a really good career path and set them up for success, I think that goes a long way as well. We have time for one more quick one, and then we're getting the, um, the uh, cane from the side here. <laughs> Hi. Oh, that was loud. <laughs> okay. Um, so you mentioned that you've had a couple of potential like crisis situations that you've had to deal with. I'm just wondering what your process is when you see a potential crisis on the horizon. What steps you take to deal with that before it becomes a major situation that affects your entire organization? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah. So building out those roadmaps and and being like we're big believers of like don't put your head in the sand. So if there's if there's issues with your model or there's things you're not 100% proud about um, that you're doing or you think that something could change in the market, like have conversations with people in your team, right? Like debate, talk about it. Um, when crisis does appear, you tend to go into the teams and, and on our side, it's, it's very much a cross-functional team. So we're getting a lot of people together and a lot of times the way we've been able to get out of things is by whiteboarding it and like building out a plan and then getting everybody to, committed to saying, okay, yeah, this makes the most sense and then move forward. So like in our online world, like we always got a saying that like if you're not innovating, you're dying. And so like the, the internet reinvents itself every seven years, right? So we're like four years in, into, you know, a journey here. And so if we're not different than we were three years ago, then we're, the competition's going past us, right? So you got to continue to keep pushing people forward. And sometimes that's difficult because some people get stuck in your business that, you know, like the status quo, right? So it comes back to hiring and the culture and you got to get people that are willing to, you know, grow within the gray and uh, be able to kind of take things as they come. But um, I, again, it comes back to, I think, the people and, and building the plan. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.